after you have constructed a model that appropriately includes different sources of method variation, you have markers or some direct measures of those sources of method bias and you have established that the model is identified and have estimated the model, then the final question is how should the modeling results from your method variance model be interpreted. In this video I'll take a look at common practice that is a bit bad and how these model results should be interpreted. Let's start with a bad example. This is not entirely horrible because there's some details reported about the markers and uh, then these authors actually uh, try to justify the markers. Sometimes markers are used by simply stating that a marker variable was used and that's it. But what makes this a bit of a bad example is, is how exactly these uh, results were interpreted from the marker model. So the common strategy which is suboptimal is to do a two-step process. First you compare the fit of the model with and without the method factor then you uh, notice that adding the method factor to the model does not improve model fit and then you conclude that there's no problem. This is uh, insufficient for a couple of reasons. It is insufficient because we don't know if they are not identified, not finding a significant difference is because you don't have enough power. It is possible that there actually is a method effect but your sample size is too small to detect it. This relates to empirical under, under identification as well. So instead of looking at whether the measurement, whether the factor model with the um, method factor explains the data better than the model without the method factor, you should be looking at the magnitude of the estimate. So do the, uh, does the method factor, regardless of whether it fits the data well or not, explain the indicators more or to, uh, roughly comparably than the actual indicators? And what is the magnitude of method variance in the indicators? So you should look at that and then also look at uh, how are the correlations between the items affected or, or regressive, uh, sorry, uh, the, the, the latent variables. So uh, you look at is there method variance and if there is, does that method variance cause bias? If so, how much? Just looking at whether uh, relationships stay significant or not is insufficient. For example, if you have a regression coefficient of 0.5, and that coefficient goes down to 0.2 when you add a method factor, that would be something that the reader should know, even if both of those effects uh, remain significant. There's also, uh, there are conceptual issues as well. So uh, this is unfortunately a common practice and uh, the, the issues, additional issues in this model are that uh, they are using hierarchical factor models here. I haven't seen any methodological article that would uh, provide a justification for using that kind of model to address method variance concerns. Moreover, it seems that they're comparing models fitted to two different sets of variables. One has the method variables, the market variables, another one doesn't. That kind of model comparisons are difficult and I'm not aware of any methodological principle that would allow that kind of comparison. So uh, this model comparison approach is not really, it doesn't really make much sense to me and also how the results are interpreted is, is uh, insufficient. So how should the results then be interpreted? Let's take a look at an example or let's take a look at the objectives of, of better reporting practice. So uh, there are two things that you should be looking at. These are discussed in for example this Spectre's paper. First is to what degree is there method variance in the items? And the second question is to what degree the method variance in the items causes method bias in the regression coefficients of interest. It's possible that you have method variance but it's that does not cause bias. For example if you have let's say innovativeness measures there might be lots of social desirability bias in those measures but if your performance measure is not affected by the same source of bias then the method bias, method variance would not cause bias to regression coefficients at least to uh, not, not any serious bias. Of course if you have measurement error in the explanatory variable there is some bias but that's a lot less severe than if the same source of method variance affects both the dependent variable and the independent variable. So you need to instead of looking at whether something fits better than other 
you should be looking at what degree. So what are the actual, what's the magnitude of estimates? What are the magnitudes of the factor loadings of the meta factor compared to the, uh, the main factors? And how much do uh, the regression coefficients between the factors change when you take away the method factor? Monofit, ne various nesting model comparisons are, are useful for understanding the how the method factor uh, affects the items. And Williamson's 2010 article talks about different modeling strategies. And make sure that all models have the same variables. So in a model where you assume that the method factor does not have an effect, you should still have the marker uh, variables in the model and have a factor for those marker variables simply allow that factor to be co correlate with be uncorrelated with all the factors and not load on the items. So that should be your comparison model. William 2010 talks about this comparison. Parameter estimates, you look at method factor loadings and you compare factor correlation or regressions with and without method factor. This is not very common and I couldn't uh, find any articles that would actually show a table side by side, but many articles do report that they compare these two regressions. Important to report there are marker variables or measures of method variance in detail. And this is important because generally as a Simmering's article here points out markers, we don't know much about markers. So people use markers but we don't have much evidence and they actually work. So we don't know how well they capture different sources of method variants. One reason for this is that our methods, uh, these marker variables tend to be not reported in as much detail as the interesting variables. Like control variables, these markers should always be reported with the same level of rigor and same level of explanation and justification that you give for the main study variables. So there is like no excuse of, of not reporting them. Let's take a look at uh, two examples of proper reporting of marker value. The first example comes from Rafferty and Griffin in 2004 and this applies the uh, uh, modeling approach by Larry Williams that involves comparing different nested models. And what makes this a good practice is that they first do the series of model comparisons and they actually present the decrease of freedoms and chi-squares so we can see how well the model fits. Models fit. They first try a model without a method factor, then they try a model with method factor that is freely loading on all indicators and then they try a model where the method factor is loading on all the indicators but the loadings are constrained to be equal. They identify or conclude that the model where the method factor affects each item differently fits the data the best and then they go with that model. So this is a, a, a good ex example of on the level of detail that you should report the model comparisons if you use the Williams 2010 technique that was available at that time as well but uh, he just hadn't published the paper. Another uh, nice thing about this uh, article is that it pr reports these factor loadings. So we can actually take a look at how much the method variance affects each item and how much these actual variables that of interest affect each item. What's interesting here is, is uh, to beyond comparing that these method factor loadings are fairly small. They are, they are substantial but fairly small compared to these uh, actual loadings. The interesting thing is to know that these bureaucracy items uh, load very highly on, on the same on the, on the bureaucracy factor or the market variable factor and the reason for these high loadings is that this factor, this final factor actually uh, combines uh, the marker and the method. So it assumes that the method and bureaucracy are the same so this model is actually uh, perhaps slightly misspecified. A more realistic model would have had two load, had a, another minor factor for the bureaucracy items and then one general factor for the method. And that would avoid the problem of, of misspecification here that this assumes that the method and bureaucracy are the same so that bureaucracy affects these items, not only the method. I'll talk about this um, modeling problem more in another video. And then there is uh, my paper, one of my early papers. I've, uh, I did the analysis for this paper after taking the first course in structural ecosystem modeling. And we report also uh, loadings for the model and uh, for the method factor. And 
we actually do this right. So we allow the marker variables to be freely correlated. So we, we, are, we are saying that the markers can measure something else beyond method, but the marker variables and the interesting study variables are only correlated because of the method. It's not reported in the article, but that, that's actually how we did it. And if you check the decrease of freedom, you can see, you can see that our decrease of freedom reveals that there were some other parameters estimated that are not reported in the model. So that's what we did. And uh, to make this even better, we should have a, a CFA mo model without the method factor so we can see how much the method variance affects the, um, the correlations. Importantly, in both of these two examples that I just demonstrated, the decision, uh, the explanation of, of method variance or the diagnostic of method variance is, is not a yes or no question. So neither of these examples do something with method variance, declare it's not a problem and then continue without modeling method variance. Method variance is always uh, a problem that occurs to a degree and it's useful to instead of trying to answer a yes or no question, more useful approach is to include the method factor in the final model to see what is the effect of modeling method variance on the results. And uh, this is what, what we do and this is what the previous example did. So both of these articles actually present the final results including the method factor. Then we can uh, be confident that if the method factor was modeled appropriately, which we wouldn't know based on these results, then the result would be correct. Of course, whether uh, you model all the sources of method variance correctly, that's uh, easier said than done and as, as I discussed in another, another video about marker variables.